Romanist uh, and very committed to the archaeology of London, was the person who, who brought me there to give me a job back in the 1970s. Uh, and I have stayed involved in the archaeology of London uh, ever since with, with various uh, detours. But uh, today I will be, I'm returning to the stuff of which I, I, uh, we're all concerned, which is London. Um, and I've decided to talk to you about the fourth century. Uh, the reason for this is I, I used to try and talk about Roman London as a whole, and I would never get past the first 50 odd years. And it, it seemed to me the only way of getting to talk about the later city was, was to, to, to compress it into a single talk. But I'm still going to be talking about the very long fourth century. Uh, in that there's a lot that goes on in the earlier city that influences how uh, Rome and, and London operated in, in its latter stages. So very long fourth century. Uh, I start with, a, with an introductory slide simply to, to, to remind us that I'm talking very much about the city of London and that the Roman city uh, is now beneath all of that concrete and glass. And of course, it is the construction of all that concrete and glass that has given us so much valuable evidence to work on. Um, in discussing the fourth century, we have uh, some quite interesting new approaches to the study of, of Roman London's final years. And I did want to start by making an, a, an important and necessary tribute to James, James Gerard, now professor at Newcastle, as important work on the latter stages of Roman London. Uh, and he worked for PCA archaeology as, as well for a while. Um, and his critique of the reading, the very historical reading of, 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 of later Roman Britain uh, has challenged a lot of our understandings. He's challenged the idea that we can characterize late antiquity as decline. This is obviously very influenced by uh, the decline and fall described by uh, Gibbon uh, and about modern assumptions about change representing decay, end of empire. Uh, He's challenged the concept of decline. He's reminded us of the incredible difficulties we face in providing chronologies in late antiquity. Roman material culture changes drastically in, in late antiquity. We cease, we, we start to see the cessation of production of the more characteristic types of pottery. Uh, coin use changes, coin import changes. And without good dating evidence, uh, we, we start to lose track of quite how we work out what's happening to our sequences uh, in, in late antiquity. Uh, on top of that, we have the problems of survival and characterization, uh, how the thick, dark earth horizon, and I'm not going to talk about dark earth today, the thick, dark earth horizon is seen as having eaten into and absorbed uh, deposits of late antiquity, and therefore evidence, sorry, and therefore an absence of evidence, the fact that we don't find things uh, 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 of these dates we're talking about, can also be a product of disturbance. The way in which patterns of refuse disposal changed through time, that surface middens replaced rubbish pits, and the way in which in late antiquity we start to see a shift towards uh, an increased number of, of timber constructions uh, after a period where masonry had been quite dominant. So James has brought our attention to a whole series of problems in dealing with the uh, archaeology of the end of Roman London. But uh, what I want to do today is fly in the face of everything I've just said and remind us that the histories that we have for the period, the uh, framework that we take from the literary sources is still a valid one. It's not to dispute the problems of dating and sequential evidence, but it is to recognize that, that we have uh, a framework that we should be looking at and working sometimes within and sometimes challenging. Um, in particular, it's important to recognize that the, the changes that James has described uh, are themselves a product of a changed approach to living in London. Uh, and our ability, inability to recognize what's going on is in part because what's going on has changed drastically. And those changes, I think, need to be seen in the context of the earlier history of Roman London. We have cycles of change in London that we can relate to historical events. Uh, we have a lot of very good dating in the earlier parts of Roman London sequence. Uh, dendrochronology has just brought miracles to our understanding of Roman London. Uh, the precise dating from tree ring dating has let us see that structures in London are being built 
at important moments in Roman history, and that there is frequently a causal relationship between those historical events and the decision to build in London. Uh, emperors are making decisions. Those decisions are impacting on whether new waterfronts are built, whether amphitheaters are built, uh, and, and so on. And that earlier history of relating change to, sorry, that, that earlier sequential evidence of relating change to events in history is still a relevant mechanism, a valid mechanism for dealing with what's going on in the fourth century. So I want to do two things. I want to walk back a bit from the fourth century to look at some of those earlier changes to see how they establish a framework for understanding Roman London. And then I wish to argue that the traditional historically framed narratives still remain a useful tool for our understanding of the archaeological evidence. Notwithstanding, James is important to critique. So this is a kind of pendulum swing back, but, but without dismissing uh, the reasons for having swung the pendulum. So if we go back into what London is doing earlier on in the Roman period, the city saw a remarkably rapid expansion, a flow of it driven by its role as a, uh, an entrepot, a port city. Uh, this is, of course, the picture taken from the glorious model uh, formerly in the Museum of London. I'm not sure whether it's going to be uh, carried through to the new museum in uh, Smithfield. I do hope so. It's a gorgeous thing. Uh, based largely on the work of Gustav Milne and Trevor Brigham uh, at Pudding Lane and along the Roman waterfront. But this is showing a vibrant port city, and it is because London is serving this central role in the supply of goods. And this in turn is because of the importance of London for supplying uh, the enormous forces that Romans stationed in Britain. Uh, the concentration of troops in Britain exceeds that of, of pretty much all other parts of the Roman Empire. And as a place with a large military force, it was very necessary to build instruments to ensure their well-being, their upkeep, the logistical supply. And for the campaigns that Rome continued to pursue throughout most of the earlier part of, of London's history. And this is true for pretty much the first century of Rome's presence in Britain from AD 43 the continuing programs of forward campaigns required massive supplies of grain, of wine, of oil, and London is part and parcel of that, that support mechanism. Um, and it, at the same time, becomes a central command place in the network of Rome's control of Britain. Uh, we can argue long and, and, and probably shall over questions as to the status of London, as to how the government is structured, but I don't think there's any dispute that it is central to the government of the province. Um, and so we are looking at a thriving port and an important administrative centre. That London fails, and it fails through a sequence of events um, that, I, again, I, I'll, I'll not be going on to in detail here, but we see a major contraction in the course of the second century, and there are other periods of uh, London shrinking uh, in terms of population density. Uh, Plague is one of the mechanisms I suggest is involved, manpower crises, uh, inflation. There's a whole series of, of different factors, uh, military campaigns to bear in mind. But London goes through a, effectively a recessionary period uh, after its peak in the Hadrianic and Antonine period. Um, but it revives. And this is where I, I start to get into the story I, I wish to carry forward into late antiquity, because that revival is a mark of uh, the forces that keep London or put London back on its feet. Um, the contraction is followed at the end of the second century by vigorous waterfront building. And that vigorous waterfront building, I suspect is started uh, with the rebellion of Clodius Albinus, uh, who puts himself forward uh, as a potential emperor uh, on the basis of the four legions he has at his command in Britain. And Clodius Albinus withdraws troops from Britain for campaigning in Gaul. Uh, but in order to do so, I, I think there is a strong uh, signal that he is, he is investing in London as a launching pad for him to put together fleets to, 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 to move across the channel. Whether or not Claudius Albinus is responsible for what we see going on at the end of the second century, we do know that immediately in the aftermath of his defeat in the Battle of Lyon, uh, that the victorious Septimius Severus sends a new governor to Britain and major new waterfront construction is put in hand. And dendrochronology dating shows that uh, after the February defeat of Clodius Albinus, uh, later in that 
spring or summer, new waterfronts are being built along uh, the Thames. And this is in order to allow Rome to reinforce the province that has been abandoned by Clodius Albinus, who's withdrawn troops, to reestablish Roman authority. And London is playing the central role in uh, enabling the, uh, the, the regaining of control of, of Britain. And this is a pattern I, I suggest is, is repeated. Um, and we can see that following on from the restoration of London in the uh, Severan period, uh, following Clodius Albanus' uh, rebellion, uh, we have the building of the town walls. Uh, I suggest these are likely to be early third century, and I, I think Caracalla is, is, is probably the chap we have uh, responsible. Uh, in any case, Caracalla is, is certainly responsible for uh, seeing through a Severan program of dividing Britain into separate provinces, establishing uh, London as a capital of Britannia superior, whilst York is providing that role for Britannia inferior. Um, and so uh, the building of the city wall, a major construction program, following on from uh, a re-engagement in the affairs of Britain uh, under the Severan dynasty in, in response to the earlier revolt of Claudius Albinus. And that provides a generation's worth of uh, investment in London, uh, London's early third century is a prosperous period. We have some richly appointed townhouses uh, with mosaics. Uh, the most famous of London's discoveries is the one you see on, on the screen in front of you. The Temple of Mithras is built in this period uh, in the early third century. And we have a, a wide variety of uh, investment in London, not on the scale of the earlier port city, but still uh, significant and prosperous. And the construction of masonry structures through much of the town. And our cycles of up and down continue in that we have a third century recessionary period. Uh, this is perhaps most easily associated with what's generally termed the third century crisis uh, in the 250s and 260s. Uh, again, we may be looking to military problems. We perhaps are seeing the influence of, of, of plague and uh, manpower crises. But what we do know is that in the course of the third century, London's waterfront is dismantled and London's role as a port city is essentially ended. Uh, the timbers of the waterfront quays are chopped back. Uh, we see uh, an end to the significant levels of import of oil and wine from the Spain and Mediterranean. Uh, the numbers of amphora coming in in late antiquity drop off very markedly from the earlier situation. And this is a, a series of activities that can be dated reasonably well by implication from uh, the dendrochronological sources. We can identify lots of construction activities going on in London into the uh, 240s, into the early 250s, and then an interruption to timber supply. Uh, it doesn't always matter where the timbers are, it's just the very presence of timbers being uh, imported into London that we can measure. And this is perhaps associated with uh, the uh, end of London, sorry, he's definitely associated with the end of London as a functioning port. Uh, there are a variety of arguments as to what's exactly going on. Uh, and one of the more popular arguments out of London's archaeology is the problems of tidal regression, uh, as the Thames uh, is no longer uh, seeing tides coming in uh, to lift boats into the port. But those that episode of tidal regression is not of a sufficient scale, I think, to account for all of the evidence we're seeing. And this is because the period we're looking at is also one of uh, instability, uh, and in particular episodes such as, as, as the arrival of, of Posthumus' Gallic Empire, where in the uh, 260s and 270s uh, we see a breakaway empire in Gaul. There are problems with Frankish piracy. Uh, the coin you see in front of you is uh, a coin of Posthumus uh, from his Gallic base, uh, referring to reducing the Neptune, to, to victory over Neptune, uh, implying uh, victories are being achieved, perhaps against Frankish piracy, which we have uh, emerging as an historical uh, component in the period. <clears throat> and I'm going to briskly move on from the plague of Cyprian, which I, I think is perhaps one of the causal factors in that. Uh, but this is uh, contributing, perhaps, to the uh, disappearance of the Classis Britannica from the historical record. We are seeing an end of uh, certain activities in the region. Uh, iron working on the Wealdon sites sees a downturn at this period. Um, and I think this reflects on manpower shortages. But what we're seeing is therefore 
a further recessionary period leading into yet another revival. And this is the, the emphasis I'm going to, to, to be drawing from this is the cyclical nature of contraction and reconstruction. Um, and the main signs we have of what's going on uh, as we move into the late third century come from the work along the Riverside Wall. Uh, the Riverside Wall is imperfectly dated. It, it uses and reuses a number of timbers, but it is clearly late third century in date. It coincides with a significant change and shift in the nature of pottery supply to London. We start seeing things like Alice Holt pottery coming in in significant quantities. Um, and the city is in part repopulated at this broad period. We start to see building activity. Um, so London has now been uh, perhaps walled under Caracalla. The Riverside Wall is to complete the exercise of walling the city off, uh, but is therefore also marking a definitive end to the port as a key element in the supply of Britain and or in, uh, in the, uh, moving people out of Britain uh, on occasion. Uh, and this is also to do with a post third century crisis, uh, complete reorganization uh, of uh, supply. Uh, we're no longer seeing the troops in Britain uh, being supplied with the luxury goods on the earlier scale that was the typical of the Severan period. Uh, and as a consequence, people are looking more to uh, local supply mechanisms. This is encouraging the garrisoning of Britain to function uh, more locally, uh, less driven by a port city such as London. Um, so a, a key shift in the emphasis of London from being a thriving port city, but a walled enclave uh, of Roman power and authority. Um, the construction of the Riverside Wall, as I say, is accompanied by a variety of other building activities of the very late third century. I would suggest that we can uh, see uh, the uh, reabsorption of the Gallic Empire uh, posthumous into the Roman Empire as being uh, influential in this. I would suggest that those uh, the construction of the Riverside Wall it may be Aurelian, it may be Probus. Of course, Aurelian's walls of, of Rome itself are an important feature of, of the period. Um, and we know that there's town wall building going on in other parts of the Northwest provinces uh, under Probus. So those late third uh, century uh, reurbanization or revival of urban centers is part of a political strategy in the wake of the uh, reabsorption of the Gallic Empire. And we see this reflected elsewhere inside London uh, with some house building. But we've also seen the closing off of the port facilities as also having an important impact on the nature of the city as a whole. And this is reflected in the Forum uh, and Gustav Milne's work uh, on the Forum Basilica uh, shows that the latest floors in there are dated by the presence of this Alice Holt pottery that we see coming in at the end of the third century. Um, but is that that is followed quite rapidly by the beginning of the program of dismantling the Forum Basilica and its uh, reuse. Uh, given that we don't have uh, surviving large chunks of the Forum Basilica, I've cheated here and shown you Silchester's. Um, but Silchester is also showing how these uh, public buildings are uh, significantly changed in their role and function in, in the late third and early fourth century. Uh, at Silchester, uh, the uh, Spodges you see on there uh, represent uh, ironworking, and we have some evidence of parts of the porticos around London's Forum also being converted to industrial activities. Um, and this seems to be that these spaces are no longer uh, these vast marshalling yards and markets associated with port activity, associated with the, uh, the supply of Britain, but instead uh, can now be converted to other uh, forms of use, uh, perhaps as public lands that can be rented out to, to, to other forms of uses. Um, it's important to, to, to spot the difference here, perhaps, between uh, changed function, the disuse of these public buildings uh, in their former character, uh, as not necessarily representing decline. We, in this, we can perhaps agree with uh, James Gerrard. Um, the very fact that we are repopulating these spaces with other activities is showing that the city is still uh, making things, doing things, it, it, it's busy in, in a different way. Um, now, the speedy 
attention I gave to the uh, dismantling of the Riverside uh, Keys and its replacement by Riverside Wall. Uh, I did try and relate back to uh, piracy. Again, it's, it's uh, uh, a difficult issue to know quite how serious piracy really was, um, but it does seem to have been an abiding concern in the imperial propaganda of the period. Uh, and just as, as we saw uh, posthumous uh, issuing coins celebrating victory over the seas, we see the appointment in AD 286, uh, only a, a, a less than a decade after, about a decade after uh, London has been reabsorbed into the Roman Empire proper. Um, and the appointment of Carausius uh, clearly set up uh, in, in the terms of his, his, his employment to uh, organize defenses against seaborne raiders threat of piracy. Um, his coinage reflects on this. You can see here uh, the happiness of his, his oared galley. Um, but Carausius, uh, being accused of, of, of having misappropriated the uh, booty recovered from pirates, uh, fears for his head. And so rather than suffer the consequences, uh, sets himself up uh, as a breakaway uh, usurper uh, and the creation of the British Empire. Um, and that leads to another period of uh, building activity in London. Um, it's short-lived to start with, uh, but we have this rather splendid uh, building complex down by the Millennium Bridge. Uh, again, dendrochronological dating giving us an absolute spot date for it. We have uh, AD 294, the piles being driven into the ground to build what do look like two classical temples, um, never built above foundation level. So quite what they would have looked like when completed, we will never know. Um, but the construction of these uh, dates to the period of the British Empire, uh, Carausius himself has, has been replaced by Electus, um, uh, probably killed by Electus, but uh, in any case, Electus is the uh, British emperor responsible for the construction of this complex. Uh, so the slide at the bottom shows the excavations of Peter's Hill. Uh, one of my last involvements in London was a project manager of that exercise. Um, and my son still swim, swims in the swimming pool that was built out of the, the whole the, the, the construction of that temple made. Um, but the, the impression we're getting from this waterfront location by the Millennium Bridge is that of uh, a palatial complex being planned, uh, but never completed. Um, and probably borrowing uh, it, from the detail of the other palaces being built in the Roman Empire at this period. Uh, we're seeing uh, Friere, Thessalonica, and Milan as housing imperial palaces of, of this tetrarchic period. Um, and this revival of London that we can associate as having perhaps started with the collapse of the Gallic Empire followed up by the introduction of the British Empire, is seen through then by the reconquest of Britain. Uh, Constantius uh, organizes a fleet to reinvade the province, uh, to reconquer it from Electus and his forces. And the uh, Arras medallion, found as part of a, an amazing horde uh, near, just outside Arras in, in France. Um, and the medallion there, which I'm sure you've all of you seen before, reproduced on, on book covers and in, 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 in slides it is a fantastic illustration. It's the first visual representation of London as a place. It's L-O-N, London, uh, kneeling in front of the walls of our city. Um, one suspects, not based on the real thing, but just simply to represent the idea of the city uh, receiving the victorious Constantius and, of course, his gallid fleet arriving uh, to help restore London after the breakaway empire. And I finally got to the fourth century, so I can start to just chill a bit. Uh, rushing to get here, says I had time for it. Um, we then get into the fourth century with the successor to Constantius, of course, is uh, famously the Emperor Constantine. Uh, and Constantine, who is proclaimed emperor, in, in, in York, um, and there is a brief period where Constantine, following in Constantius's wake, Constantius was his father, uh, is interested in the affairs of the Northwest provinces. Um, 
He uh, visits Britain on a couple of occasions, as is suggested by his, his coinage. Uh, and we see this perhaps reflected in building programs in the early fourth century in London. Um, the uh, construction of uh, a rear extension to one of the buildings at one poultry uh, uh, by just opposite the Bank of England um, uh, is dendro dated to the uh, first decades of the fourth century, not precisely in this case. Um, Important, this is one of the last secure dendro dates we get. The managed use of woodlands around London, the supply of timbers for construction activity, which had given us a splendid dating chronology, uh, disappears from the uh, archaeological record uh, after the constructions at One Poultry. Um, but at the same time, uh, pottery dating is showing a series of other major constructions happening in domestic architecture, we get the appearance of some quite intriguing large towers being added to bigger townhouses, uh, certainly the case of Plantation Place. Um, uh, also, uh, this, this example of the Southwark. And we are seeing at the same time, London as being an important administrative centre. Uh, it's the base of a mint for a while. It had not minted coins during the earlier Roman period, uh, prior to uh, the Carousian episode. Um, but it continues as a mint uh, under Constantius and Constantine and produces coinage, quite splendid coinage, uh, down to AD 3 to 6. But that early Constantine, Constantinian uh, involvement in London, uh, following on from Constantius's presence, uh, does not seem to be sustained. And indeed, there is a political shift uh, away from the Northwest provinces uh, towards uh, parts more central to the Roman Empire. Uh, and as we all know, Constantine is, is very busy shifting his attention to, 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 to the empire as a whole. But he moves the base of operations uh, of his court uh, from Trier uh, to Sophia in AD 316 to 7. And I suspect that's quite an important date for seeing the, the end of this phase of, of, of busy building activity in the early fourth century city. Um, and as a consequence, we see a generation of activity continuing within the various buildings uh, that marked the early fourth century. Uh, we have uh, a reasonably good sequence of floor repairs in the Temple of Mithras, um, probably no longer dedicated to Mithras. Uh, and this is just, again, just because the image is too pretty not to use, um, the splendid infuser found uh, on top of uh, one of the walls of the, of the Temple of Mithras associated with its later phases of use. But the floors themselves are coin dated to the middle of the fourth century. And we have other activities, perhaps smaller in scale than was going on in the beginning of the fourth century. Um, but we also have the possible arrival of Christianity as, as an organizing force within the city. This is uh, not directly demonstrated by the archaeology of London, but it's an implication that can be drawn from what we know is going on in the other cities of the Northwest provinces. Um, but I, I think that there's a strong chance that, that uh, David Sankey's argument that the remains at Colchester House are indeed those of a uh, Christian basilica. I believe that's, that is a, a reasonably good argument. Um, Dave drew on the parallel he could draw with the uh, Santa Tecla in Milan. Um, and I, I know this because uh, at the time that Dave was digging Colchester House, uh, I was actually working in, in Piazza Duomo in Milan. Uh, and Dave popped round for a glass of wine at my place with his sketch of what they were finding at Colchester House. And I pulled out my sketch of what we were doing in Milan and uh, compared notes. And that, um, he's, I think, built a strong argument on the back of that. Um, it's a large basilica if we reconstruct the evidence from the pier bases. But more importantly, it's got glazed windows, it has marble interiors, uh, and it is probably built in the period 350, 360, that sort of period. And this is a time when Christianity is uh, post-Constantinian, is, is beginning to develop uh, Episcopal churches in its bigger and more important cities. Um, and although uh, not directly related to the structure, uh, the recent discovery uh, at Brandon House by PCA Archaeology of this uh, Oxford color-coated uh, mortaria with its scratched uh, Cairo 
uh, is a further demonstration of, of, of the importance of, of Christianity. Um, and so what we're seeing is a city which is remaining an important uh, walled enclave of power. It's got walls now all around it. It is gaining some of the important attributes of an administrative city. Things like a basilical church would be illustrative of that. We know from the much later Notitia Dignitatum uh, that various departments were being based in London uh, under the vicar of the British provinces um, and treasury, uh, a variety of other administrative departments are based within London. Um, and that's been reflected perhaps in part in what we're seeing in the cemeteries around the town. Um, this is one of the more exciting graves uh, reported on in the uh, Eastern Cemetery volume uh, by Bruno Barber and Dave Bauscher, um, a burial of a Roman official. I say official. Um, he's, it is a chap, and that chap is buried with symbols that tend to be associated with officialdom, not uniquely so. Um, but intriguingly, although this official has a brooch and belt set, they usually considered to be very late in the fourth century, uh, the C14 dating uh, has been reassessed recently uh, and does seem to point to a date uh, prior to AD 365, uh, thanks to the Bayesian statistics that can now be applied to those C14 dates. And that makes it an unusually early instance of the burial of these belt sets and brooch sets, the crossbow brooch and, and the uh, chip card belt set, uh, marking an important, uh, probably official of that date. Um, and that walled enclave, the city walls that we've discussed, uh, continue to carry importance. Um, we have episodic attention to the defences of London, and that does seem to be uh, related to uh, periods of heightened administrative and political concern in Britain. Um, these are two of the bastions, uh, one of the earlier excavations at Camomile Street. Uh, this is the bastion that has so many of those wonderful uh, bits of sculpture stone that decorate the Museum of London. Um, and the other example being the uh, bastion excavated by John Maloney and his team at uh, Crosswall, uh, recently and very splendidly uh, represented in a new display at Vine Street. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you will have already planned to visit if you've not already done so, it's well worth it. So the city wall there with the bastion in front. Having rushed through some of these early fourth century uh, activities, construction activities to the wall, uh, political activities. I, I want to give a context of what we, we're seeing going on in some of the discoveries I've just described. Um, Amienus Marcellinus describes the barbarian conspiracy in Britain. And that barbarian conspiracy is seen as a sufficiently big deal to justify quite a few paragraphs in his account of the period. In AD 367, uh, troops, They've been dispatched to Britain under Count Theodosius. They came to Britain by way of Richborough, uh, sorry, came into Britain through Richborough uh, and came to London to respond to a breakdown of civil order seen as a conspiracy of, of, of barbarians. And they made their base, and this is, this is effectively quoting from Amiens Marcellensian translation, they made their base in the old town of Londinium, which later times called Augusta. And if you want to ask why it's called Augusta, the answer is I don't know, but you can ask him questions and we can have a chat about that. Um, what we do know is that the revolt of the uh, circa 8367 uh, had involved the slaying of the Count of the Coastal Tracts, presumably the series of defences later known as the Saxon Shore, uh, a chap called Nectarides. Um, this is being recorded, so I now say this with great hesitancy. I would love to imagine that that burial in our Eastern Cemetery at Mansell Street with that crossbow brooch and that chip car belt set, high official, the sort of chap who probably held the sort of office that might have been one of those described in the Notitia Dignitatum, receiving these accoutrements, these marks of high status quite early in life and being buried quite early in life and much before they're carrying on into wider currency in, in, in other contexts in the Roman Empire. Um, it's the sort of thing you might get if, if you were to find the burial of Nectarides. I'm not saying it is, because I can't say it is. We have no way of knowing. 
but just that kind of how close do we get to touching history from the people and the things we find. Um, that was speculation, and I'm sure when this recording goes out, it, we, people can cut and skip through that bit. Um, but the points I wanted to make from this uh, were the way in which uh, London has remained a seat of political authority. It is the place that Count Theodosius made for when he came over to suppress the barbarian conspiracy. We know he lingered in the city. Um, he is, I think, the likely uh, author of the bastions being added to the city walls. We don't have a precise date for those bastions, but they date to that mid fourth century period, 350s, 360s. Um, and his interest in reestablishing Roman political authority in Britain through the capital city of London is clear in the literary sources and I think is, is likely to be reflected in the archaeological sources. So London is still a seat of important political authority. It's the place Roman generals go to. That said, it is not functioning in many of the other ways that we would expect of a Romano-British city. Throughout the history of Roman London, there is precious little evidence for the involvement of local elite society in the affairs of the city. We don't get the inscriptions uh, from uh, local uh, dignitaries. We don't have a surrounding uh, group of, of Roman villas. And indeed, when we do get villas around London, they, 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 they start to look a little bit more like the suburban estates of officials than necessarily your traditional landowning uh, local aristocracy. So we don't have strong evidence for the engagement of a local community. Uh, also, as we've looked at in the way in which the port uh, is dismantled, perhaps because of fears of piracy. Uh, that port, sure, there are going to be places still where ships are beaching when we've got evidence of, of, of that going on. And there would have been gates through even the Riverside Wall, but nothing like the scale of importation that the uh, lengthy waterfronts of the second century uh, supported uh, and third century supported. Uh, so London has lost its that economic role in supply. And as I've said, that's largely because of the way in which uh, as a consequence of the uh, third century crisis, uh, the, uh, the, the garrisons of Britain were, were looking more to local supply mechanisms than, than to, to significant levels of imported goods. Um, and therefore, what I take through as we head into the latter stages of the fourth century is the evidence we have of cycles of investment in London. And I have oversimplified grossly oversimplified in my bullet points on this slide, quite what I've tried to run through to get to this point. The way in which uh, you could argue that London's landward wall is because of the Severan reinterest in the city following on from the breakaway empire of uh, the us usurpation of Clodus Albinus. The way in which the Riverside Wall might be a, a product of uh, central Rome uh, regaining control of its northwest provinces after the uh, end of the Gallic Empire under Aurelian and then Probus. The way in which Constantius and Constantine uh, inject activities into uh, London following the brief-lived British Empire. And then as we go into the 360s, the way in which we can see uh, the bastions of London perhaps reflecting on a military and re-engagement in Britain uh, after the barbarian conspiracy. That undoubtedly oversimplifies, but there is a relationship between investment in London and Rome's interest in the province of Britain. Um, as we head towards the last decades of the fourth century, our evidence gets thinner and thinner for the reasons that James Gerard outlined and I described in my first slide. Uh, one of the more intriguing of the later finds are, are these uh, pewter-lead alloy ingots found in river dredging at Battersea. Um, the odds are actually that these uh, didn't originate in Battersea, uh, but are part of uh, dumps laid on, uh, into the Thames for uh, the building works in Battersea using material recycled from Shadwell Basin. And therefore, this may well come from one of these suburban villa estates uh, the one at Shadwell that I've mentioned, where there is potentially an official administrative role. I rather suspect that the Shadwell site is associated with the 
uh, organization of the fleet, but that's a very speculative. Um, but these ingots come, uh, the, 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 the drawing perhaps just make out shows that there are stamps on the uh, gray blobs of ingots, and those stamps uh, show us uh, Segres and the Cairo, uh, the Cairo now the uh, almost official symbol of uh, the Roman state. Um, the Siagras family, we know are active in Gaul in well, throughout the late fourth century, but a particularly prestigious family in, in, in the uh, 380s. Um, and it is also likely that the use of a stamp, hoping God with the Cairo, uh, that that use of that, that, that Cairo is more likely to post-date uh, Theodosius' edict, edict of Thessalonica, where he makes uh, Christianity the religion of state. And therefore, uh, you'd use these sorts of things to mark uh, it, goods being imported into Britain uh, by the state. Um, whether or not these relate to the tail end of what we're seeing in, in the uh, construction of bastions, in, in, in the, 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 the throughput of, of what's going on in London in, in that fourth century period, whatever, whatever they represent, they look to predate uh, some major changes. And this is when I get back into that difficult decline word. Uh, what we've seen before are cycles of investment, and those cycles of investment are followed by periods of relatively small-scale, limited building activity. And so what we're seeing in the back end of the fourth century, to start with, looks just like more of the same. We've seen a busy intervention in the 360s, uh, perhaps going on to circa 380. Um, but we then start to see this evidence of, 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 of quietening down this cyclical uh, loss of interest of the state in, in Britain, uh, becoming more exaggerated. Um, the slide you see shows uh, a picture drawn from the excavations at One Poultry, 1994. And the culvert you see being worked on there, uh, a rather splendid uh, brick-lined culvert, is channeling a significant flow of water from springs up in the Gresham Street area uh, towards the Warbrook. And the channeling of those uh, springs and that those watercourses have been managed actively all the way since London's first creation. Uh, AD 48, I think, is the first of the timber drains there. Uh, this is its successor on a larger scale into the fourth century. But in the late fourth century, that culvert ceases to be used as a culvert. Uh, and there is actually a decapitated skeleton found in its fill. Uh, and it's certainly no longer carrying the flows of water it did before. The street alongside the culvert uh, starts to be quarried for its gravel. Holes are dug into the street surface. This occurs not only uh, here, as we're heading towards a bridge across the Walbrook, but it also occurs uh, along Borough High Street uh, and as we're looking to head towards London Bridge. When you look at what ox carts do to the gravel surfaces, when you look at what a quarry pit would do to the ability to drive oxen along those roads, you have to question the extent to which the bridges that these roads are approaching are still being used on any significant scale. Um, Goods are not being moved around town in anything like the volumes that we'd seen in the early Roman period, but not even the volumes that we'd seen in the third and early fourth century when road surfaces are still being on occasion repaired. Um, in the excavations of poultry, uh, Hilary Cool did some very useful work with colleagues on the slightly odd nature of the finds assemblages associated with the latest floors of, of, of shops and, and houses there. Uh, recognizing that goods that are normally recycled uh, were actually ending up being discarded. And that looks more like abandonment horizon than simply the continuity of use. And these do appear to date circa 380s. This is also, as we see this period, the beginning of a phase in which uh, coin supply progressively diminishes. Uh, the mints supplying London tend to get further and further away from London and tend to be used less and less creatively to supply London. There are, the influx of new coinage uh, begins to fade off. Not the first time it's happened, 
uh, there have been problems of coin supply in Roman London uh, all the way back into the, 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 the well, all the way back actually, but, but significantly so in, in, in the second and third centuries. And at all previous times when coin supply had diminished, we start to see the arrival of local imitations and copies. Uh, and this is true even into the 360s with the Valentinian issues uh, being imitated. And those local, they're often called forgeries, uh, should be seen as, 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 as a local attempt to make good shortages in the supply of small change. They're not forging high value denomination coins. They're creating small change currency, pocket money, not pocket money, it's, it's my children again, uh, the, 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 the things that you pay for small scale transactions. Um, and the ending of a period in which people needed such supply, uh, and it seems more likely it's an end of need rather than end of ability, because the, the, the manufacture of these things is, is not enormously technologically difficult. Um, that cessation of supply is reflecting on a changed nature of uh, small change, small uh, of, 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 of transactions. And this is where I would start to go back to, to, to the arguments we looked at at the very beginning, James Gerrard's arguments, and start saying what we're seeing the problems of dating London are because the things that we date themselves are uh, active ingredients in the material culture of London. They provide a role and those roles have changed. Even if people are continuing to live in the buildings in London, they're not living in them in the same ways. And those changes of, of, uh, in the way they're living is reflecting on a diminished role of a range of activities. And in particular, if we're looking at transactions, the main body of people engaged in transactions are, of course, the officials and military community. Um, allied to these changes in the material culture, allied to these changes in what's going on in terms of movement around town, uh, we also get, I won't call it proliferation, that's an overstatement, but we get a number of these rather interesting uh, hordes uh, placed in wells. Um, uh, Southwark produces examples. Uh, there's one I don't know much about yet because it's not yet fully published from the Bloomberg building, but this is the splendidly published example and perhaps the best of them uh, from Draper's Gardens, uh, where the excavations by PCA uh, found uh, uh, th this uh, metalwork hoard in a well. And the, these hoards are not buried for recovery, these are associated with feasting events. Uh, there are venison bones found with these. Uh, there are richly broken and damaged items found here. There is a, uh, a, a set of activities going on which are uh, best described as termination rituals, rituals of departure. People are feasting and then they are closing off the well. The well ceases to be used, these goods cease to be used. Um, and these are best dated also to this broad period, the 380s thereabouts. Um, and if one were a leading figure in a local community and moving away from London, these are the sorts of parties, these um, uh, termination rituals that one might anticipate. Um, and so what I want to do is to uh, get close to the end now, uh, the fourth century is about to end on us, um, and give you a political context. And this is simply to show, are we seeing something a little bit akin to what we've seen earlier on? And uh, what we've seen earlier on is the when London ceases to be vibrant and used, it is in the context of political changes. And here we have uh, the major political change of the 380s, and as you see, that's where I'm trying to place much of this evidence, is that the army of Britain proclaimed Magnus Maximus as emperor, uh, and he heads off to continental Europe uh, to defeat the Western emperor, Gratian, uh, and he establishes his seat of power in Trier, but then goes on to be defeated by Theodosius in Italy in AD 388. And that is... Uh, blamed by Gildas, and I'm really not going to place any reliance on Gildas. Don't worry, I don't necessarily believe a word of this. What do I? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Gildas directly blames Maximus, 
uh, Magnus Maximus, for having deprived Britain of its soldiery, governors and youth. Um, whether Gildas is right in giving all of the blame on Magnus Maximus, it does seem to be likely that a withdrawal of forces from Britain to pursue a program of military activity in Gaul would have a deleterious effect on such an important administrative center as London. And this then sets in train a period, the last 20, 30, 40 odd years in which London is seen as a city of Rome in which actually London is very rarely directly controlled by Rome. I think I've seen it said that there's about eight years uh, between 383 and 420, about eight years in that period in which Britain is being directly ruled, effectively ruled by Rome. It is on the margins of uh, and effectively left to its own devices. Uh, and Trier itself, and London and Trier are almost twin cities. Tr London it, it takes so many ideas from Trier, takes so much from Trier. Trier also is diminishing in importance. Uh, the, it, it, is, the, it ceases to be a seat of effective government. Uh, the Praetorian prefect, the head of, of the northwest provinces, uh, moves their seat of government uh, to Arles in further south in 395. Um, it's not quite the end. We do have evidence of activities in London in the 390s and up to 400. Um, uh, in particular, there's a quite important uh, addition to the city wall uh, found at the Tower of London, um, uh, excavated by Jeff Parnell some time ago. Um, we also have from the Tower of London uh, the silver ingot found far too long ago for it to come from a secure archaeological context. Um, but associated with coins of, of, of the very end of the, of the fourth century. So London does see sporadic, occasional, small-scale uh, activities and interventions. Um, and they take us to the end of the fourth century. But we have nothing from London that we can securely date to the fifth century. Now, continuity of use of the shell of a building is very difficult to know about if it doesn't involve new construction activity. We don't have new floors, we don't have new walls, but maybe we're still seeing buildings carrying on in use. We no longer have the production of the ceramics that give us tight dating, so there may be continuity of use. And that early fifth century uh, use of London is still very much uh, to be explored and to be understood. I don't think we know quite when London ceases to function as a town. Um, but when you plot what we do know of what's going on in the fifth century, and, and the slide you see is, is, is a little bit uh, oversimplified, um, but when we do plot what we know that's going on in the fifth century, we get occasional discoveries that can be securely dated to the fifth century. And in almost all cases, they are from outside of the city wall. Um, there's a very important coin hoard from principal place. Uh, next to the uh, fourth century cemetery, but in a ditch looking to be associated with the uh, latter stages, if not after the end of use of that cemetery. Um, we have uh, eclipse siliquen. People argue, and uh, credibly, very credibly, that the practice of clipping these coins is, is a fifth century one uh, from Brandon House uh, in Southwark. Uh, we've got pottery assemblages of fifth century dates, some of them are not actually early, but later fifth century, from sites outside the walled area, uh, Aldersgate. Uh, and we have somewhat later on in the fifth century, uh, settlement sites that we can identify, uh, Clark and Well, Bermondsey, um, and of course, at Martin in the Fields. And, uh, and the images you see at the, the sides of this slide are uh, drawn from, from uh, uh, work by the Museum of London, at St. Martin the Fields, where there is credible evidence that identifies fifth century building activities, uh, in particular, an archaeomagnetic date established on the tile kiln there, suggesting this to be not in operation in the early fifth century. And that's a fascinating uh, date and activity, uh, given that a tile kiln is to make building material and therefore, presumably, for the refurbishment and maintenance of tiled roofs, perhaps bathhouses. Uh, at this non-urban site. But what is intriguing is that these discoveries are outside the walled area. Um, 
within the walled area, we have the, the famous saucer brooch from, from the Billingsgate bathhouse, uh, but that's found in the demolition horizon uh, near a likely port of entry into the walled city. Uh, it is a single solitary uh, find. How it got there is an interesting question. Uh, and we know, you know, I, I've drawn a triangle to show where St Paul's Cathedral is. Uh, this, of course, is relating to the uh, much later uh, re-establishment of, of London as a seat of authority in, in the seventh century. But the St Martin in the Fields discoveries, of course, relate to uh, a likely antique site, Roman site, but then also forms uh, part of the post-Roman landscape and is next to where the bird of London Wick, sorry, the Vicus at London Wick, the Wick at London Wick, uh, subsequently emerges. Um, so I, I would argue that basically the stuffing is knocked out of London in the 380s rather than in the fifth the fifth century um, and I would suggest that that is consistent with the nature of the political involvement of Rome in London and this is because London had become purely an enclave of administrative and political power and as Rome ceased to have the time to engage with the affairs of Britain and the Northwest provinces as Britain ceased to be a place of military authority because the uh, change nature of its garrisoning uh, when Magnus Maximus withdraws troops we see no attempt then made to restore Britain to its former state, and hence it ceases to be a functioning Roman city. So I see it as a fourth century failure, not a fifth century one, but the archaeology is still there to play with. Thank you. <laughs>